Public works projects such as roads, bridges, and large buildings are often presented as being all benefit and no cost. But how should we assess the costs and benefits of such projects? With me in the studio is David Seymour from the Frontier Center for Public Policy. David, what is the meaning of public works mean taxes? Well, on the face of it, it means exactly what it says. Every dollar spent on things like roads, bridges, stadiums, cycle tracks, and so on uh, is a dollar that has to be taxed from somewhere. If I were cynical, I might just say, move on, there's nothing to see here. Yeah, you certainly might, especially when you consider cases where spending produces very high value. For example, the public health benefits of sanitation that we get from sewers, high value public works like that make taxes seem trivial. On the other hand, uh, there are what you might call optical illusions associated with public works that can make it very hard to remember the obvious fact that public works mean taxes uh, even when they produce little of value. You're talking about boondoggles. Oh, sure, yeah. A really obvious example is the bridge to nowhere in Alaska. Um, this bridge was supposed to go to an island with a tiny airport and about 50 residents, but spending $400 million on it uh, was ultimately not justifiable. How bad can public works be separated from those that do create value? Uh, well, the obvious question to ask when you want to separate bad public works uh, f from good ones is, first of all, could the service be provided privately? Uh, if not, then it may be a project for government. But secondly, even if it can't be provided privately, you should ask, well, hypothetically, if the service was provided privately, what would people pay out of their own pockets in order to use it? If they would pay together as much or more than the actual cost of government doing it, then it's clearly an example of a project where government has a competitive advantage. Otherwise, it probably shouldn't be done at all. So you're talking about a price for something that can't actually be bought on a private market, like most things. What's a real example of that? Oh, well, well, for example, before we had municipal water and sewer networks, many people died of infectious diseases such as cholera. Um, added together, people would probably have paid a lot more than what a sewer network actually cost uh, to avoid those illnesses. The reason it didn't happen until government did it was that everyone was waiting for someone else to pay, so it never got built. Um, so there are examples where governments have a competitive advantage, and they can actually do some things uh, better than anyone else can. So that's an example of where a government project has an advantage over private funding. Yes. Getting back to these optical illusions, specifically, what are they? Well, the biggest thing a public works project has going for it is that it actually exists, whereas uh, the things that are given up in order to build it don't exist. By definition, they never come into existence. Um, the, the Public Works Project, on the other hand, is highly visible. Uh, both when they're being built, you see all this activity and employment, uh, and when they've been built. By comparison, the things that might have been brought uh, into existence can only be imagined. There are no sod turning ceremonies for those things. Yeah, pretty much. And, you know, a bridge, for example, is, is seen every single day. Uh, whereas all of the cars, electronics, houses, and other things that could have been brought into existence, well, they take an effort to imagine and just once, but keeping them in mind permanently is even more difficult. So it's a matter of keeping something front of mind, and there's a natural bias towards keeping things that actually exist in mind. Yeah, and there's other factors too. Public works are usually big ticket items. Uh, in comparison, uh, the things that are given up tend to be much smaller items, like we talked about the houses and cars versus bridges before. Um, now, because the costs also are spread widely across many taxpayers over a period of time, it's difficult to see that they have the same value as the project that they were sacrificed to fund. This sounds a bit like the elephant in the room argument, too big to be noticed. Y yeah, sure. And, you know, take a sports stadium, for example. It's really big, and many great events happen there. Uh, it's probably a permanent part of the cityscape. Now, say it cost a government $100 million. Each of those dollars collected had to be raised in taxes from the public. Uh, but a stadium was therefore built instead of all the other things that people might have bought uh, with the same money. But the stadium's often portrayed as completely new wealth because the lost wealth is so easily forgotten in its shadow. So what's the lesson for thinking about economic policies that create large public works? Well, it's simply to be aware of, of the optical illusions that public works create. Uh, it's about allowing for the fact that many small sacrifices made when taxes divert spending uh, into public works must, of course, add up to the same value uh, as what was spent, even if they're harder to see. To summarize, public works mean taxes because all public works can ultimately be paid for. Oftentimes, the value created by public works can justify the taxes required. 
It's important to recognize that the permanence and magnificence of public works can distort their true costs and benefits. This was episode four of this series based on the book, Economics in One Lesson. The next episode, Taxes Discourage Production, focuses on how taxation affects behavior. Until then, I'm Jamie Stevenson, and this has been On the Other Hand. <laughs>